I'm Victoria Rush. I'm the director of No Woman No Try, and I'm here at Kimura Performance to tell you a little bit about me and what's going on. First of all, it was because of my dad. He always watched on the TV, shouted at the TV, and I kind of wanted to be involved in that. And I didn't really have any personal involvement in the game until I got to uni. Found for the first time ever in my life when I was 19 that women actually played rugby. Went to trials in my second year. And that was it. Never looked back, never played another sport again. <laughs> rugby was sort of this mad first 12 months where I started playing for uni and we had this varsity in Leeds where Leeds Uni played Leeds Met. That was kind of the, one of the bigger events you could do, but it was my first ever match playing rugby. So it was suddenly this enormous event at university that I was kind of roped into somehow. And that was an amazing day. First time I've ever played rugby in a competitive match, ever touched the ball, scored a couple of tries, and was just like, this is the best thing I've ever done. Later on that year, I played at Twickenham. When we got to the Bucks set final that year, and it has to be the best rugby memory I've ever had. That bond that you get, because it's such a physical sport, you're connected to your teammates immediately. That, that physical and, and everything that you go through together. You've got 22 friends for life, and from that moment, you know, you kind of can't really ever go back. There were definitely prejudice against me playing rugby. Probably, first of all, came from my parents. The concern of getting hurt in a physical game, which I think is really normal for guys or girls. Your, your mum tends to get a little bit concerned. You might break something and, and all that kind of stuff, which I definitely had. I never really had the critical side of it until I think I started working in London, commuting, and you've got like bruises all over your legs and your arms and maybe like a black eye every now and again. People look at you in a different way when you're trying to get on the tube at seven o'clock in the morning because it's different to what they see. When I mean, you come to work in offices in London and they're not used to women who play sports that are that aggressive maybe. And so it does come with its comments and it's underhanded comments and there's always this underlying thought, you can see people thinking it, but they don't necessarily say it. It's just something that's in the room because you play a sport that then don't necessarily agree or haven't ever seen women play. I never really cared too much, so I think that really helped. I actually quite liked that people thought that sort of thing about me. You know, I was different to everyone else and I brushed it off quite easily. But it's definitely there, which means it's always sort of been there. And then when you get to things like Twitter, where people are much more open about their prejudice against women doing certain things. Uh, it becomes sort of almost harder when people start to write it down and send it to you directly. So over the years, I have played for West Park in Leeds as my first ever club, which holds a very special place in my heart. Uh, I went on to play for Yorkshire whilst I was still there. When I moved down to London, I have played for Richmond, went over to Harlequins, and I'm back at Richmond now. So the I'm Enough movement, for people who don't know it, was off the back of Canterbury, the kit maker. They launched the Irish International Kit. They used the male players as models for the men's kit. For the women's kit, they superimposed the new photos onto female models. And other than that obviously being a terrible decision, it took away huge opportunity for the female players who could have been in that campaign to be seen by their nation, to gain notoriety, the opportunity to gain more sponsorship, more opportunities to be in campaigns, all that kind of stuff. It just, it takes the opportunities away from these people but still gives it to the men. And in many ways it represents how female athletes are seen, is that they're, even though you play for your country, it doesn't really mean as much as it does for the male players to do it, and it doesn't matter as much, we don't really care, like, it's fine, we're not going to pay you to come, but we're going to pay the guys to do it. And I sort of sat back and looked at it, and we'd had the Twitter, it had been caught out on Twitter that this had happened, but with that came a lot of negative commentary about how female athletes aren't good looking enough to be models but you look at footballers it doesn't matter if they're good looking or not they're good at their job so they they get the top job for modeling or for whatever or for the front of fifa or whatever it may be so why is it any different for the female athletes because it always comes down to how somebody perceives what they look like it's not even necessarily societal judgment it's an individual's view on whether or not they think you're good looking enough to be the front of their, their campaign but the men it doesn't matter they're the best. Johnny Sexton's the best at what he does, so you pick him. But you go to the women's team and you question whether or not you want to pick, it, pick them. So 
It just reminded me of being a kid and trying to go to the gym when I was like 16, 17 at school and the boys told me only lesbians went to the gym and well, what, the, what the hell does my orientation have to do with whether or not I want to exercise in a certain way? So the only way I'm allowed to exercise is by playing sport that my school gives me. I can't exercise too much because that's too manly, but if I don't exercise enough then I don't have the right body to fit into society's view of what I should look like. So I can only do it a certain way. It just reminded me of all those feelings and now kids have social media and yeah, 13 is the like entry level age to social media but we all know kids younger than that access it. So they go online, they see all these comments about how women don't deserve to be athletes or don't deserve to be models, whatever it may be. And what does that feel like to them inside? So do they then choose not to play sport or not to follow their dreams because some asshole on Twitter told them that they, shouldn't, they don't deserve to do it or they shouldn't do it? I just thought... This is our opportunity to create the alternative narrative to that. So they might see that being said, but as long as they see us saying the opposite, hopefully it means they will follow what they want to do, they will follow their dreams, they will pick up sport, they might pick up rugby, which is obviously what I would love, but they'll pick up anything and they might keep running when they're older, whatever it may be. So that was really what it was all about, was just making sure somebody in the future doesn't have to feel the way I did when I was their age. And. Um, Hopefully it's done that. One person's enough for me, but anything more than that's an absolute dream. The transitioning to film was probably quite a different path than most people take. I'd never made a film before I made No Woman No Try, so its success has been really humbling and I feel very fortunate for it to have got to where it is, but from the start, Back when I was a teenager, I used to work in theatre. So I was always really interested in the sort of creative, the visual kind of arts. But I ended up going to business school instead of drama school, which, <laughs> don't tell my dad, but he was right. I should have done what I wanted to do and not what I thought I should do. But I, I went into business school and it definitely helped me along the way. But it was always there in the back of my head that I wanted to work in something far more visual and something far more arts related. And I sat in my living room uh, staring at a blank TV I just thought if I could get my dad to watch something on the telly, somebody else might do that. They might get their dad to watch something or their husband or, or their son or their friend to watch it and maybe that would help us make some of the change that we'd see. I think that was pretty much it. I just thought if I could put it on that, if whatever it is that we create could go on that, then it might just help to make a difference tomorrow and someone might make a better decision tomorrow than they would have made yesterday and that's how change happens. I can't make change the world overnight, I can't make that kind of drastic impact but I can make small incremental changes every single day that hopefully make the world a better place. So that realistically was how it happened. It just felt like it brought like everything together from working in that kind of visual industry to playing rugby um, to more working in marketing over time, like it all just sort of found that was where it was supposed to be. I found uh, Ben and Jack who made No Woman No Try. I kind of explained to them my story and um, they said yes. We started filming like 10 days later. I met them on the 4th of December 2020 and we were filming in December 2020 and we finished filming August 2021. Signed the contract with, that, with Amazon December 2021. Which is nuts for someone who's never done it before. So the future plans are to continue to grow the voice of No Woman No Try. I think it had an exceptional kind of impact to start with. I'm obviously biased saying that, but I feel like it did. Now we're going to take a panel talk roadshow on tour across the UK and Ireland and actually have the conversation with the clubs. I think it's really important that we talk to the grassroots game. That's 90% of the game. The top 10% is the international guys and the international stuff that the unions do, but we need to be working with the athletes who come down to the clubs every Sunday work behind the bar and keep the clubs running and those people for me are the like, most important in the game so we'll hopefully be visiting 20 clubs over the next sort of 10 months which would be great I'm really excited to do that hopefully a proper party uh, when we get to it and then in general I hope that No Woman No Try is the first of many pieces of women's sport content I want to hang my hat on women's sport. I think it's one of the most exciting places to work and those athletes deserve it more than anything. You put your money where your mouth is. Us as women will show you we are worthy, as we always do. Mic drop.